is this a form of apologetics? Yeah, absolutely it is. I don't deny that, but I'm a Christian. What else do you expect? Sorry, maybe I got you mixed up with somebody else. I think I did, actually. Yeah, some other gay person. Welcome, everybody, to our very first interview here on The Apostate Sisters. So a few weeks ago, we put out a call to our listeners to see who might be interested in sharing their story on our channel. And the response has been pretty overwhelming, which is great. There are so many people who are ready to share their story of their time in Armstrongest Cults. And so we're going to start with our friend, Joel. Joel is a TikToker extraordinaire who has a YouTube channel and his original TikTok called Mr. Difficult. Hello. Finally, some theology to tear apart. So in this booklet, there's like this whole section dedicated to humans, uh, or at least Christians, being the rulers of the world and then implying that they could be the rulers of the universe. Welcome to the inaugural episode of is this a false prophecy or something I just made up? This game is particularly, did Herbert Armstrong say this? No American astronaut will return from the moon alive. Please take your time and ponder and don't go searching for the correct answer. I'm about to show it to you. Indoctrination of the Youth, part five. Well, this is found on the RCG main website. Do you know David Pack? written by David Pack. He talks about how amazing he is. So he can be found there making all kinds of comedic content about the Worldwide Church of God and all of the Armstrongest cults. Welcome to being our very first interviewee, Joel. How oh, are you? Thank you, Joel. Thank you. It's such an honor. Welcome to the Apostate Sisters. I know you've been with us before. I mean, you're a host now on our new series, Unpack It. Joel is a very funny guy, and I had the pleasure of meeting you in person recently. That just made my life right there. It was incredible. How is sweaty Florida, by the way? It is, uh, what is the temperature? It's 86 right now. Yeah, I'm sure it's like feels like somewhere in the 90s. But yeah, something well, like that. Nope. It's like 74 Gross. here in central Illinois, and that's enough for me. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm all about the heat and humidity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I so like it hot it, and wet. <laughs> oh, we know you do, Joel. We know you do. <laughs> so Joel, you have some amazing content on your channel. Um, we found you actually relatively recently. We had no idea there were so many fellow survivors. How did you get involved with Worldwide Church of God? Were you raised in it? So I was born into it. My birthday is 1989. So that's a couple years after Armstrong died. It was just becoming a thing that you could see doctors. And it was just, and the, the makeup and stuff like that. And like, you, you could, like, women were allowed to have makeup, all that stuff. So I never was part of the WCG where they weren't allowed to have makeup. So it's like, I was kind of like right at the beginning of the, the major changes. I personally didn't even realize that using doctors and medicine actually changed at some point. I know Armstrong went back and forth a lot, but I, that was one I didn't realize had changed. So from what I understand, it was like an unspoken rule. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't think it was ever really put out as an absolute, but it was stated that if you went to see a doctor, that your faith was in question. And so that was the, that, that was the major thing about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when did you get on TikTok? Because I know you're, you mostly have your following on TikTok. You are moving over to right. YouTube now, but your videos are really funny <laughs> and they're really quick. You know, you just come up with these ideas and you put together these funny little clips showcasing maybe some people that are still involved in it, showing mm -hmm. some of the very harmful teachings in the doctrines of the worldwide church of God. So why did you start putting this content out? And like, who was your target audience? So uh, it all began uh, almost a year ago, back in June, um, when uh, June of 2023, when mm -hmm. I watched Shiny Happy People. So uh, I was already familiar with uh, various characters online, uh, particularly in the ex-Mormon space. Nuance Ho 
was one of my first ones. And then I came across oh. Cults to Consciousness. The main host of that one is also ex-Mormon, but what they do is they invite people of all different cults on there for interviews. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's like to spread awareness and to have a safe space. I love both of their content. I also love Fundy Fridays. They were inside of the Shiny Happy People documentary. So I was like, oh, this might be interesting to actually watch. And so the, uh, the Fundy Fridays was the uh, Jen from Fundy Fridays. Uh, everyone yeah. calls her Reverend Jen um, as a joke. Awesome. And it's <laughs> and so kind of like how you guys are the apostates. Like she she's Reverend Jen. She, she also has something like creating the lesbian socialist republic or something like that it, it, as a, as a joke. <laughs> Awesome. Um, but any, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I mean, uh, absolutely, but people. sounds like this sounds like we would like her content. <laughs> yes, absolutely, very snarky. So anyway, I, I watched uh, Shiny Happy People, and and I was just listening to the similarities that were between the WCG and uh, IBLP. And so there were a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. And um, I, even watching the content on Cults to Consciousness, it's like a lot of the people that they were interviewing had a lot of similar-ish beliefs, but the beliefs of the WCG are unique. There, there's something special about them. And I thought it was something that, that needed to be brought more to light. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things that are kind of like, uh, overt versus covert uh, coercion and stuff like that. And so it was more, it wasn't as much as like physical threats, but it was absolutely like other types of like, um, oh, you're not following the work or something like that. So I just wanted to like bring that out and like spread awareness. Uh, my target audience is for no one inside the cult like that is it, it's funny it's like if someone happens to come across it and is still inside of it it's like fine they can the watch it but for me the whole purpose has been uh to tell people at large what the this particular cult is uh to spread like the knowledge about it because it's in the shadows no one really knows about it right and then the the other thing is for people who have left it and i love the community that has uh, that has been blossoming recently um not just yes. my content that started in september but yes. like you guys came out around the same time we have other like uh people that we know of who came out uh, around the same time and it's it's really interesting that it's all at once at the mm -hmm. same time. And and so I just think it's interesting to be part of that wave. I think you brought up a good point there to recognize that there does seem to be kind of a wave going on right now yeah. in terms of uh, a broader cultural interest in cults and mind control type of things. I mean, it does kind of seem like the culture at large is ready to unpack some of the the BS that's been controlling us. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you look deeper into it, you know, you've looked from Worldwide Church of God to the offshoots and seeing how that um, seems to play into the same way of controlling people's minds. And I think if we keep looking at that, we'll realize, oh, no, like that's a culture wide problem. Like those things are happening just in more subtle ways, kind of in every arena that we look at as people trying to live together on this rock. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, to add on top of that, you you just reminded me. Um, so my channel's also about biblical weaponization. And mm -hmm. so you're talking about mind control and stuff like that. And it's like having come out of the WCG um, and then becoming familiar with like the tactics that were used there and then seeing those same tactics used in uh, in more mainstream churches as well. I also dig into common arguments that are used against people and then like tearing those arguments apart, which is something that I did learn how to do from the WCG. Um, we were talking before in other, um, I, I think it's maybe in one of the episodes, how we, I think it's actually episode two, huh? So where we were talking about how it's like we were trained to be able to debate and so, mm -hmm. and to tear things apart. So that's, the, so I am able to use those tools while looking at things that happen in mainstream churches. One of the clips I pulled out for the upcoming episode is actually you talking about the debate skills and me yep. pushing back on the realization that like, okay, men were taught how to debate and women were very intentionally taught not to. But that's something 
That's something I think uh, would be interesting because uh, another person that may be interviewed by you guys said that it was, um, it, it might have been like a regional thing, uh, like uh, because I particularly remember very, very, um, I guess the the best way to uh, like. Uh, knowledgeable women, like uh, women who, who knew how to hold their own. And this is in uh, Buffalo, New York, and Erie, Pennsylvania. Those were the two main congregations I was part of. And uh, also, when I was part of the UCG in Orlando, I also came across a lot of women who knew their stuff. So it is interesting that you say that, because in my experience, I haven't really noticed that. I wonder if that was a, a shift that happened along with the changes after Armstrong died. Because I wonder. women... Yeah, like if women were allowed to wear makeup and things were changing in general, especially with regard to women, I could see that. But anyway, well, that's not exactly part of your story. But I'm sure it figures in, right? The gender yeah, does, binary yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. I think things really took a shift after Armstrong's first wife, Loma Dillon, died because she was very much the religious person. And um, Stanley Rader had very... Uh, had a lot of influence over Armstrong and things started to shift in a more secular direction. And I think that's kind of where it was like, okay, well, you can start wearing makeup now and now it's the 80s. So we kind of have to be on board with what's going on in social climate at the moment. And quite interestingly, how the PCG, the Philadelphia Church of God, is almost like a snapshot of 1986 WCG. So it, it is interesting, but you'll notice that there are certain things that would not have pat flown in the 70s. So it's like, it's, so you can see they're kind of like frozen mid 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we will discuss the splinter churches at some point. We're going to touch on them a little bit in our next uh, episode on the timeline of Herbert W. Armstrong, but we will go into them more in depth because I'm finding all kinds of things. And I love that all of us are finding some sort of sense of community when it comes to former members of the Worldwide Church of God, because here we either we brush it aside for a while, and then all of a sudden these people just start coming out of the woodwork. We didn't even know we were supposed to be looking for them. <laughs> and there, there's all this social media surrounding it where people can connect with each other. What's different about you, Joel, is you are still a Christian. Um, Patty and I are not. We were never able to convince ourselves that it, anything in the religious realm it, is true. L like, we're just not convinced that a God exists. But for you, uh, you found yourself still in Christianity once you got out of Worldwide Church of God. So uh, what sort of differences did you see between the WCG and I guess you'd call mainstream church now? Though you do have some pretty unorthodox um, viewpoints on Christianity. So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. So I was born into the WCG and I was born with a major medical condition that required that I undergo surgery in order to save me. It was right at the time when doctors were allowed to, to be seen. And so um, my mother was always grateful that that was the case. I was just curious, um, like your parents' level of uh, like sticking to what the church required would that have meant that if they had not changed it to allow surgeries, would they have chosen to not have a life-saving surgery done on you? I honestly can't answer for them. From my understanding, they probably would have done it anyway. Uh, just like okay. knowing how my mother is in particular. She was desperate. Like she really wanted to make sure I lived because I would have died after like three days. It was a ticking decision. And my mother was disfellowshipped a couple years after I was born as well. So she was known for being... Um, Highly spirited. <laughs> what? Say. I can't imagine that by knowing her son. It, it, it's funny because, uh, it, yeah, she was just fellowshipped a few years after. It, it was my father that that brought me to the WCG. And there mm -hmm. were times where my mother would, like, go to, like, a feast or something like that. But it, it, she was pretty much done uh, throughout my childhood. So as I grew older, we eventually moved from New York to Ohio, right at the time when the Christmas Eve sermon took place. Um, and so Christmas Eve of 1994, and I particularly particularly say Christmas Eve because we did not do Christmas. And so I, I just I just love saying it. And <laughs> so uh, Joe Tkach Sr. presented like a really long sermon where he basically said that it's like inconsequential, that it has nothing, no, it's like it's done away with. That 
cause a huge uh, ripple effect across the church. And so by the time I moved to Youngstown, the split with the UCG had already happened. So mm -hmm. you have two adjacent towns. So I lived in Austin town. And so the WCG still met in Youngstown, Ohio, but the UCG met in Austin town, Ohio, which is the town I lived in. And so it was like literally next door, like the towns next to each other. And mm -hmm. so uh, we would often do things with the UCG, even though we were still technically part of the WCG. Uh, we did foot washing. Really? Yeah, really. I remember attending the foot washing for Passover in the location where the UCG met. It was, it Wait, was really how old were you at that point? Because the foot washings were like uh, a strictly adult only. <laughs> no, I didn't partake. I didn't okay. partake. I Thanks. watched. Oh. I oh. watched. Yeah. They were um, and, and I mean, they were yeah. That mm -hmm. was for was us, there. that was a big deal because we got a babysitter. Like it was a no yeah. kids thing. I might have been like just preteen at the time that I, the most recent one that I remember, I was like 12, I think. It was in the all purpose room of a middle school. And <laughs> it was, I, I particularly remember that last one. After that, the changes started happening so drastically that it was like a sudden shift where we no longer recognized the holy days. We did Christmas and Easter. Saturday went to Sunday. Matzo that was used for the unleavened bread became actual loaves. My mother actually has a joke about the when they first started doing that. Oh, and the wine became grape juice. And I remember as a kid, I was like 13. So I was hiding in my parents' parents bedroom when the minister was over at the house and I was like eavesdropping on the conversation like through their bedroom door like I was literally like army crawling on the on the ground just to listen to the drama because I loved drama and and so I fed off of their argument <laughs> that's my shock face you <laughs> love drama <laughs> what <laughs> well no today I don't love it as much so I only like drama in certain instances. But then I was like all about gossip and like uh, telling people where it was at, all, all that type of stuff. I was a little dick. I will, I will definitely say that. We left officially the WCG a few weeks after that, that meeting because the minister would not budge. He sided with uh, Takach Jr. on the, a lot of the changes. And so um, there was so much that was said against Joe Dukach Jr. Actually, today, like now I look back, I'm like, oh my goodness, they really went through a lot. Joe Dukach Sr. and Jr. It's like all the people hating on them. It was like, it was horrible. So we officially left. Then my father started, uh, he really wanted to be part of a church. My father is like super duper knowledgeable on scripture. So is my mother. They're like yin and yang when it comes to biblical knowledge. That's how I have the biblical knowledge that I have today as well. It's because of their penchant for, for really studying. And my mother was also secretly against God at this time. But that's her own story to tell. She okay. was secretly against him, but she didn't want to ruin my walk. So she played the part essentially, but she was against him. She didn't want anything to do with God. But she's Christian today though. It's, it's really interesting. Anyway, so my father would go to like, uh, another congregation like every other week it, he would kind of like dip his toes into the waters of different congregations to see if there was anything out there that matched anything like what we believed or that wouldn't throw us out for the beliefs that we had i uh there were times where we were thrown out because we didn't believe in hell there, there were times that because we didn't believe in the Trinity, that it, it was like we were seen as heretics. It was Wait, really? all, all this stuff. Really? You, really. Because my, really. my experience of churches is that if you ask any individual believer in a church, they're going to have just a slightly different take yeah. on things. I haven't heard of people being mm -hmm. kicked out for having like one different oh, thought. Yeah. I particularly remember a time. Oh, when was this? It was this, actually, this was like the 2010s. Uh, this is after I officially left the cult, but it was in the 2010s when I had, uh, there was this one guy who was like, I forget how he phrased it, but he basically said that if you don't believe the way that I believe, then you can just feel free to go. And it was, it was like, yeah. Wait, was that the pastor or something? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. So this pastor uh, was vying for a position within some church that my dad was eventually became part of. And then uh, after that failed, he decided that he was just going to have his own home church, not my dad, the other guy. 
And so we would go over to their actual house and have a house church over there. It was about 10 to 15 of us. But as the weeks went on, it was like he had certain beliefs that if you did not believe these things, he just he he would say it's OK, but you could tell it wasn't. And then it eventually came to the point where he's like, if you don't believe the way that I do, then you can go. This happened a lot. And so I left churches on bad terms very often. I was one of the ones that would stir the pot as well. I would be in like Sunday school, uh, like a 14 year old in a Sunday school with all this Armstrongest knowledge. And then have like some teacher come and start teaching some stuff. Like, for example, just for example, uh, the concept of the rapture or the concept of hell. And I would tear them a new one because I knew all this. A new what? A new what? Tear them a new what? <laughs> well, it's just like me. Tear them a new anus. Oh, I actually didn't think that. Okay. So, so the medical condition I had when I was a child was I was born with an imperfect anus. So I couldn't go to the bathroom. So I would have poisoned myself after three days or so. And so it would have been sepsis or something. But yeah, so I would tear them a new one, just like mine was torn. I love uh, that you're not afraid to put it all out there, Joel. I admire that. No, about I, I came on here determined to yeah. not give a shit uh, and to actually just put it out there. Neither like do we. And, and we're both to the <laughs> point where we just can't censor ourselves. We, we really can't. Because right. how does that help anyone to censor yourself? Things yes. like, like that shame that you don't want to say this thing because people will think less of you or they'll judge mm. you. So fucking what? There are people out there that may need to hear it. So I, I love so, that you're putting yourself out there. This lasted for about five years until my dad finally landed a church. Actually, I recommended he try this church because I was at school. Someone invited me to their church. I told my dad. My dad loved it, became part of that church. Boom. It, it was like he actually found a church. And so I would like support him by going every other week or something like that. But every time I would enter a church building, every single time, I always went in there with the idea, I know better than them. Because it's like my entire life, I had been raised in the WCG type of thinking that we are better than everybody else because we have the truth. God has chosen us. And the way we viewed it was, yes, we have a greater burden to share uh, to, to the rest of know, the world. And <laughs> you know the story too well. <laughs> I would love to know, Joel, what you see as the things that you struggled with in like that ability to do real life in the real world because of that. Like what, you know, what do you feel like got in your way or what do you think helped you out of that way of thinking? Being very, very judgmental. Like, that was such a... I judged everybody. Not... not. It, it was... I was I was intense. And it's like, the, one of the biggest shifts for me is to go from a judgmental to as, as far as non-judgmental as I can possibly be. Now, I will call out bad things, and I will say that certain things are wrong. However, I'm not going to treat someone as if they are lesser of a being i would still go in there be an asshole and um but although i would i would act so humble and so it's like i knew how to play that off and so and another reason i knew how to play that off was i was trained to be a classical pianist i was taught by some of the greatest musicians in the united states as well as in uh, in europe and in china i knew how to play the humble game Today, like when I receive praise, it's hard for me to take it because it's like, I don't know if I'm playing that game again. It's it, it, it's that thing I don't want to do, but it's so automatic for me to fall into a sense of false humility. Now, I don't mind being prideful, like in, in terms of like, I'm proud of the work that I do or the things that I study. That's something I'm proud of, but I'm talking about thinking that I'm better than someone. Anyways, I came to college here in Orlando. The first three years I was associated with the United Church of God, which is the largest offshoot, except for the Hebrew Roots Movement, they're not really considered like a singular entity. UCG is a direct successor to WCG. Of course, we met in a middle school all-purpose room. Actually, it was like their all-purpose cafeteria type place. I remember when I walked in there, I was like, ah, oh, I'm back with my people again. And uh, I remember like 
bringing my notebook with my notepad, the uh, the memo pad, <laughs> bringing my briefcase. <laughs> oh my gosh, stuff. the briefcases! <laughs> what a funny little thing the church all did with all of their like business casual and briefcase oh, thing. Like, oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, the attire. Here in Orlando, everyone still wore suits. Yeah, I thought that was funny because the church specifically said that if you're in a tropical lo location, you don't have to. Like, they actually had a notice. Like, I remember reading it. It's like, oh, so, like, in places like um, uh, the Dominican Republic or whatever, they wouldn't be able to, uh, they don't have to wear a suit. But in Orlando, we still did. So, <laughs> um, it's I, 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 I'm just having a moment about organizations that decide it's okay for them to like tell adults what to wear yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, yeah that's yeah. why i refuse i refuse today to walk into a church with a suit on unless it's something like a wedding or or something like supremely formal um but if i go to church I, you will not find me in a suit today I, I personally don't feel as if God cared. Maybe the heart behind the clothing, but not the clothing itself. Can we know a little bit more about you? I know this is out there, but like, if you don't wear suits to church, Joel, what do you wear to church? Do tell oh, oh, I wear, well, I recently transitioned over to full-time wearing of kilts. I am a huge lover of kilts. And actually, after starting my content, there was there was a lot that happened. It, it's like a, a lot of stuff was happening men mentally as well. And so I was just like, you know what? I only live one life. Why am I afraid of wearing kilts? And I have never Were gone you? back. Oh. I was, yeah. I was afraid of the societal shame that may come from it. And so far, I've only received one negative comment. That's a good example of perception. We perceive the world is going to do something. It often goes against our perception. Yeah, we know the type of people that we're going to get negative feedback from. And do we care about their opinion? No, absolutely not. There's always going to be nope. those people. And you look absolutely strapping in your kilts and your punk boots and your nose <laughs> ring, your whole look, your long hair. It's a great look, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, the long hair. That was a big no-no. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But I like I your get look. Into that. Thank you. Actually, yeah. everything about my look is a stick it to them. It, every <laughs> single piece of it: the nose ring, the the ear piercings, the hair, the even the kill. Even though I love wearing, I've always loved the idea. It's like now that I'm more confident in them, now I can say, "Oh yeah!" Imagine walking to the WCG with a kilt on, unless you were actually Scottish. I was like um, that uh, as a teenager. I always wore what was quote unquote boys clothing you know the baggy ripped jeans the chain hanging from it and like my mother was just was so disgusted with it. she's like why don't you dress more like a woman but like, i'm wearing what i want to wear oh the writing was on the wall for you way way back when wasn't it <laughs> no kidding but to summarize like the the rest of my journey with the ucg i was with them for like really intensely for like a year and then less so the second year and then by the third year I basically fizzled out after a while I eventually did have something akin to a major mental breakdown I uh, started studying over in China and all that stuff um, but then I eventually came back home because I was mentally unwell and so I was back in Ohio I started to deconstruct at that time because that's when I really started to look at my homosexuality. And after I started deconstructing, I became part of fundamentalism and I had problems with fundamentalism. I have eventually come back to Christianity. There was a long period of time where I was at the very least agnostic, if not atheist. And mm -hmm. then I came back into Christianity because of various factors. And then like, I guess you could say God hit me like a Mack truck one day when I was at church. And I've never gone back. And it was like one of those experiences where it's just like, I can never forget what happened. It was like this veil over my eyes was lifted because we knew scripture so well in the WCG. We knew what it said. We knew all the books of the Bible by the time we were like three. But for the first time, it started to sink 
in. All my perceptions just started to completely shift. And here I am several years later, like that, that God moment that I had was in 2017. So here I am in 2024, seven years later, and I'm a completely different person today. My beliefs have swung so drastically that I think that pretty much every single belief that I have has changed in some way, shape or form. And so, and I'm open to change and I'm open to discussion and um, yes, I'm Christian, but I'm not about to try to convert people because I know what that's like. And (laughs) you're welcome. I'm about to get really raw. So I knew I was gay from the time I was eight years old, but I had had other experiences when I was younger. At no point would I say that I was abused. Actually, I instigated things with older boys when I was younger. And so the... (laughs) four years old. I distinctly remember it was me that started it. Mm -hmm. And because I remember being interested and I remember saying, oh, I wonder what they would do if I did this. Like, so I actually did instigate it. We had like this Amish community that we were friends with. And yes, I had done some things with some Amish people. It is my understanding that when young children have interplay between other young children, like within two, three years of their own age, that generally that's not considered to be an abuse situation if those children are engaging in figuring things out together. Yeah, I was four with a 14 year old. And, and so, (laughs) yeah. Okay, I mean, so. I was interested and I wanted to do it. That's kind of what I was checking in on, right? Because if it is Mm -hmm. just two young kids, like that is just a total normal developmental type of thing but yeah that is significant if you as a young child yeah were, uh, it wild. happened well, it happened when we were at the feast <laughs> <laughs> okay so so how would you tie that like somewhat unusual interest is there do you see any connection to the repression that you experienced and maybe the other yes, absolutely. people experienced That's- Could you talk about that at all? So the way that I perceived God when I was a child was like a domineering parent. And it was like every time I failed at doing something that I wanted to do in order to, to do the godly thing, I guess you could say, I failed quite often and I hated myself and I berated myself. And I was like, why can't I? And I would go to God in prayer and I'd be like, I want to do this, but I also want to do that. It was like, it was a whole bunch of stuff with that. I would never feel comfortable bringing any of my worries or concerns up to my parents or to anyone in the church. And I'm not saying that because my parents didn't allow it. Like, no, they, they always tried to encourage me to be willing to talk to them about anything. They were amazing. And they are amazing parents, but growing up in a very high control group where everyone is judging everyone. It's like, even from the time I was like three and four, I knew don't talk about certain things. And it mm. never because never because my like the sexual stuff, my parents didn't know about it. And so like, and I just I made sure that they didn't know about it. And so but somehow <laughs> you knew to keep it from them right from the get go. Exactly. Like. But it wasn't because it was what they said. It was just because of I knew that was something not to bring up. I don't know where that came from necessarily i know it's part of the cult but i just don't know where i mean that's re- way back but i knew don't talk about this stuff um deny it uh when i found out that that was what gay was i was eight years old listening to rush limbaugh oh on the way <laughs> i was eight years old listening to rush limbaugh coming home from a piano lesson rush limbaugh was on the radio And I was taking a nap in the car and and my mother was driving me to or from my piano lesson. And I remember him talking about a certain act. And then he was saying to people, now, parents, if you have children with you, make sure you turn off your radius. My mom thought I was asleep. She let it uh, continue to play. I was really good at eavesdropping when I was a kid. And uh, I heard uh, this, this act that was done and that was considered gay and i had just done that act like a couple weeks prior and so (laughs) and i knew that gay was like the thing not to talk Uh. about 
And and when I found out that I was gay, after having done things for years, that was horrible. It was like my entire world crashed in around me all at once. Because it's like I always thought, well, maybe I can like still get married and have a white picket fence and 2.3 children or however that is. But but the thing is, though, it's like I, I, I've only been attracted to older men particularly which makes sense when you think about my my childhood experiences um and so i was very much into older and it's like i i couldn't control it it's like when i see a naked woman for example there i appreciate the human figure i uh, there is absolutely no attraction in that regard but uh an older strapping man i would have been all over and and so that was that was the big dichotomy for me. And there was even a time when I had uh, an official girlfriend, and we did try to have intercourse, and that it just did not work. And I was devastated yeah. with that as well because I'm thinking like I'm broken. I was thinking I was completely broken. And so I went through that, and then going through the cult, and then trying to hide it. Go ahead. Would you say at that point? that you felt like if you could make yourself get with a woman that you would be like, okay, that would save you from this horrible thing that you now realized about yourself. Not after I tried having sex with a woman that I was. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, no, but you like, tried to, you were hopeful like, that maybe you would be straight and then accepted. Right. And, but it just, you couldn't lie to yourself. When, when I could not actually like successfully have intercourse with a woman, when I when I actually realized that, I it devastated me. It devastated me hard. This eventually led to me just like not knowing what uh, what end was up, and eventually I started getting into a lot of um, uh, dangerous situations. I guess you could say when I was uh, going to college, uh, and I had like a double life. It, it would be like I had like a goody two shoes, ne'er do wrong type of a day life. And then I had a completely separate nightlife. And never did the two come together, except when drugs came into the equation. Mm. And so I got into some really, really heavy drugs. I did enter a 12 step program because like you have to understand like me going here and there uh, uh, and like going to school like it was all of this but like still like I couldn't face myself and and so I entered a 12-step program but I noticed that I wasn't like anybody like I was not like like my story was not the same like there was something like not adding up but I played the role. I knew how to play roles. And so I ate up the, the doctrine of that 12-step program. I became a very, very, very active figure within that program. And only recently have I been able to look back and be like, that was just like a cult too. And Holy that, shit. <laughs> and I, I would push things on people. I would push... Uh, these booklets on people, I would uh, tell them where they, oh yeah, it's almost identical. You to. And, <laughs> and, uh, and this is the thing, it's like, I actually remember, I would share my story and I remember saying, I'm from a cult. At this time, I knew I was from a cult. And I said, and people say that this program is is like a cult, and I and I remember distinctly saying, even if it is, I don't care. It saved my life. I am appreciative of that twelve step program. I have removed myself as a member um, because it's like I don't want to be associated with the guilt tripping and the shaming. And there's like a culture within a culture within those twelve step programs and it's like the internal backbiting uh, uh and the backstabbing and shit talking about the other branches of the 12-step programs which sounds just oh, like used for crying out loud ecg rcg all these different ones talking about each other it's exactly the same today i don't believe that i was really ever truly addicted to a substance because I could go for months at a time without using. So it was like, I never quite ticked the attic box. And so I never quite did that. And so go, go, go ahead with what you're saying. 
I was just going to say, uh, would you say that your usage was like specifically linked to things going on in your life? And if so, how would you contextualize that now? The drugs that I took gave me a sexual rush. And so oh. I was into like feeling it. I wanted to mm -hmm. feel it as much as possible, feel something that I wasn't, I, I guess you could say like the forbidden fruit, I, I, I guess you could say. Um, and so, cause like, that's what it was to me at the time. And I was, mm -hmm. and I could not talk to anybody about it. However, after having started my content, someone I know from within that, that system has reached out to me and and said and said hey i've come out of that particular thing too and i'm talking out about against it having been cult like and so you were talking about like all the relationships and friends and stuff like that that we've gotten she has a fire for tearing them down like not the it. not not the the concept of the 12 steps necessarily because i do believe that like for like certain religious beliefs or or like how it's like i do believe it's helpful but i do also believe there are other modes available and for it to be pushed as the only option available uh, especially from where i'm from uh i'm from podunk ohio where where we had nothing else so it was, uh, so you have other things in bigger cities, but just not in like rural areas. That, so that's amazing to me how we, I got connected with her again after having silently removed myself. Coming back to like the whole gay concept, uh, because everything is just so gay. In 2017, I had joined a, a fundamentalist congregation because someone within that 12-step program asked that I come with him to a pastor's house. And so I went to that pastor's house and I remember praying, like really honestly praying, saying, if this is your will, like, don't let me walk out like a hothead like I always have been. I've always, like, gone in there with, like, uh, like an attitude and, like, would just, like, listen to what a pastor had to say and then would pull the curtain, uh, I'm sorry, would pull, the, would, would pull the carpet out from under their feet. Um, and, I, and I specifically remember praying, don't let me do that. And if there is something of value here, let me stay. And so I did. And I went through the process and I actually liked it. And so um, I did end up uh, going going back to that pastor's house, eventually went to that church, eventually started attending their Bible studies, really loving how I was part of a fundamentalist group who knew that I had some different beliefs, but were able to like take me in stride and who also knew that I was gay. Like I, at this point, I was out. I I was willing to to see where where this went. So during one day at church, I we were in the middle of a pri quiet prayer thing, and I actually like really would just went to now this is a testimony thing, so it's going to sound very Christiany. Just letting you know, <laughs> but I I gave I gave up regardless of religion. Once we like surrender in that sense, I don't mean like you force other people to surrender, but like when she just like, I can't keep playing this game anymore. And then when I was going through some stuff, I went back to China. I was, I, I actually had like everything uh, was fine again. Like I love being over there. And what happened was I found a gay Bible study over there, uh, which is really interesting because China doesn't like that, especially when they're not part of the three prescribed church, uh, uh, Protestant churches. And the fact that they're gay and the fact, and so even the fundamentalist Chinese don't like them. Then you have the Chinese government that was like, mm, this isn't a good idea because this isn't part of the three prescribed churches. <laughs> and so completely ostracized. It, it felt like home to me. And I love I was it. just going to say, do you feel like you get off on being in the out group? I loved it and I was there and what I loved about it too was no one judged each other because everyone understood that we all came from various forms of high control or or or, or something and and we we're just like letting everyone be where they were at <laughs> like while while we were studying the Bible together I loved that and then um and then I came back home and then I rejoined that uh fundamentalist church that I was talking about and all of a sudden things started to change because mm -hmm. of covid things got very far right very very quickly um, we all know what that's like with gay people and the far right and so these friendships that I had 
all of a sudden started to become strained like in more so every week because it was like you see this is what they're trying to do and they're trying to do this and one of those things that was often brought up was the gay agenda in jude it says i'll just read it quickly take your time joel you know how much we love bible verses oh yeah right but uh <laughs> but, 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 but these people scoff at things they do not understand like unthinking animals they do whatever their instincts tell them and so they bring about their own destruction so this goes back to the concept of the bible uh talking about animals and humans that has nothing to do with homosexuality nothing but i said you know this really 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 th this spoke out to me as a as a christian because it's like we have these animalistic instincts, but yet we have a calling that's greater. I, I shared that opinion, and the person leading the Bible study, it was like him and his wife were like the leaders of this Bible study. Not my pastor or anything. They took it in stride, but the next week I walked in, and uh, the guy said, you know, we were going to continue reading on, but there was something that one of us said last week that I, I thought it was very important that we should we should discuss these things. And yeah. they brought up Romans 1, and <laughs> which you know is the chapter. I defended myself. It, it was a very, very highly intense situation. And I said- But did they legit was... do it passive aggressive like that? Like there was someone who really, instead of like talking to you not, personally? Not passive aggressive either. And and so, because aggressive, aggressive. Uh, <laughs> everyone knew it was me. Everyone knew it was like ten of us. And so I had to speak up. It was not passive aggressive. Like I had to. And no, they and were so, being passive aggressive by calling you out without right, calling you. Right, right? The but, it, but move every, right there. Yeah, it's like uh, to me, passive aggression is like you can't really say one way or the other. That one was like in your face. I was very shaken up. Uh, like I was literally shaken. Then at the end of this, I was collecting my things and getting ready to walk out. And then you had him and his wife come up to me and said, you know, we love you, Joel. And, and then oh, <laughs> I and I made it outside. And as soon as I got outside, I just broke down. And then the pastor's wife came outside now you have to understand she's like this little tiny lady <laughs> she's like may maybe 120 pounds soaking wet she she was sitting right next to me when it happened and she just like opened her arms and i collapsed on her she and i are still very close today then the pastor came out uh and said to me they're gone they, you will never encounter that again. They're gone. And he gave them an ultimatum, either to apologize to me or to never darken the doorstep again, basically. And and so it was... <laughs> well, good. That's not how I thought that was going to go. You you would think so, right? Like, I, I am... I was so moved by what happened. Just the mere fact alone that he, uh, that he did... Some, that was just amazing. Enter COVID. <laughs> and all the things that happen with lockdown and all the things about the gay agenda. Can you clarify uh, what the gay agenda is? I am. I am the gay agenda. It's the calendar <laughs> in your phone. It's the gay agenda. I so there are literally Christians out there that think the gay agenda is gay people trying to make everyone else gay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly it is. yes, I don't have time to go into every story. I'm, I am only hitting the big ones, but I have had that's people pull their children away from me. Yeah. And I've had, um, because, because I was, I was just not a good influence. And, uh. and so, <laughs> <laughs> so Nancy uh, knows about that. There was this guy that decided to join the fundamentalist church. And they, they were friends. Uh, and I knew of this person. And this person had spent a lot of years in China. Are these old churches just with Chinese people? or? Well, the, the big thing about China, is that's considered like the final frontier among, among Christians. No one talks about the Muslim concentration camps. But yet, they will talk all about the Christians that are persecuted. It's like it's oh my god the, the Muslims are really badly persecuted in a certain province over there. I particularly brought that group up 
in the same church and this is during COVID times and it was like brushed away it was like eh, not as important it really shows you where the concepts of like loving your enemies because like to them Muslims are enemies and it's like uh, it's like I that's why I particularly like to go to mosques and talk to imams and to actually understand what they believe and to make friends stick it to them this missionary guy uh i speak mandarin and uh he speaks some mandarin he lived there for 15 years i lived there for three and a half and his his version of china was about the oppression and all that stuff and my version of china was about all the opportunity i love china like i really really do now me saying all that stuff will probably ban me for life although i am already banned for life but that's another story he spent a lot of time over there and he, he was all about the concept of like how the Chinese just don't know. And they've just been like entrenched in thousands of years of like their, uh, their culture and stuff. And they're just, they just, they're just sheep without a shepherd. And it's like very, very condescending, like not really valuing that they are actual people treating them like children, I, I think is the way to, to, to describe it. And it was, um, and he had a lot of things to say that, that just felt wrong. And then I, on the other hand, was very pro-Chinese culture. I love Chinese culture. Screw the politics. I'm talking about like the actual life over there. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. He didn't like it. He did not like that I always had a positive spin on, on Chinese culture because it was always vilified with him. Oh, it's just the, you, you heard David Pack talk about China. It was not as bad as David Pack, but pretty close. And, so um, this guy's over there as a missionary to the Chinese people for 15 years and is kind of down on who they are as people? Because mm -hmm. he was trying to change them. Yeah, yeah. He was, That's he gross. was their white savior. He was their white <gasps> savior. Uh, uh. Him and his, he and his wife were the white saviors. His ideas were starting to infiltrate the church because he and my pastor were very, very good friends. It was like a couple weeks later that like my pastor had taken on the same idea. He kind of idolized this missionary for having done such good godly work over in China. Society in general has done a really shitty job at teaching people to think for themselves. But that isn't the goal, is it? That's not the type of people that they want. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. There, because like it actually goes back to like trying to like make people fit into a box. And yep. for and I my gay old self, I do not fit into a box very well. I mean, I'm You've gay. I can't sit. I cannot sit on a chair right. Okay, <laughs> so I can't, I can't. I can't drive my car with my cold brew very easily. It's like <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Joel. The nice thing is, you are who you are. You don't have to change. That's who you are, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, despite what people have said. That's yep. uh, that's something I have only recently uh, learned for myself. And then one day, my pastor emails me and says, Hey, are you free at such and such a time after church? I mean, I, uh, uh, me and so-and-so just wanted to, to ask you just, just to see what you're doing and just to ask you a few <laughs> questions. And, and I'm I like, hate it when people okay. On the bush just get straight to oh, the yeah. point. I knew something was up and I knew it was probably that. And yeah. it was um so but it was funny because it was him and the missionary. Nobody else. You know Matthew Oh my 18. gosh. And so we went into this room and it was like a conference it was a bible study room. And uh, I sat on one side of the table with my witness and then my pastor sat on the other side with the missionary. And my pastor was the one who was ad directly addressing me, but I knew it was from the other guy. And so I, so whenever he asked me a question, I did this. So I just, I just went like this and I looked directly into the other guy's eyes and I, and I responded to him. This missionary didn't know that I knew the Bible so well. He knew huh. I was from another organization. He did not know I was Armstrongest. And so the <laughs> it's or like you, it's like you should pick your battles more wisely. And <laughs> um, and so I did. It was about an hour, and I did the typical WCG like find uh, like you know you know the debate thing. 
And yes. so, no, we and don't. I was, we like, don't. Well, in person, Ex right? But you've seen it. Oh, you've teach us, it. dear man. Yeah. Teach us. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, inform so, us, us poor women. Well, maybe yeah. since I'm gay, I am the conduit between the male race and the female race. But, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> but, but your what? penis links us all together. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> um, but the, <laughs> the main question that the, it's funny how we're talking about all of this while I'm talking about something very serious and it's like you know what I don't give a fuck anymore I feel empowered about it so the main question was why do you still call yourself gay and then one, one thing I particularly remember was them saying well you don't honestly believe that Jesus was gay do you and I'm like I don't know he hung around 12 dudes a lot Samson and Delilah, I honestly think that the story is more BDSM. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just made me like that story. All right. Yeah. Oh, and I remember saying in that meeting, what sin am I being accused of committing? And the answer was, there wasn't one. They were just wondering why I still called myself gay. Because in Christ, I would be gay right like I would be a new man and I'm just sitting here going would you consider yourself white would you consider yourself of European descent would you consider uh, like uh, that that's what I'm feeling. it's like all yep. these different labels that you give your own self but yet I cannot say that I'm gay because God thinks that's an abomination me talking about this you can tell I know my stuff like I'm able to to actually fervently defend myself, which is really ironic because that missionary couldn't defend back. Because I, the one thing that the WCG has taught is to drop one-liners. My mother and father, when they found out what happened, that was it. And my mother, she and I did not get along very well when I first came out. We had like shouting matches like every other day. It was a process for all of us. And um, there was a time when I was suggested that it might be better for me to go to one of those camps. I also got literature about someone who was ex-gay and, and, and who said it's always from childhood uh, abuse that happens. And I'm like, remember my story. I'm the one that instigated. I'm not the one that was abused. And, like, I, I, not to mention it wasn't an abusive situation to begin with, but I'm saying right. I was not abused. I cannot say that I received any less love from my parents or that I was just, yeah, I had a fantastic nuclear family. I, it was like, I did not check any of the boxes. Over the years, though, my mother has become a staunch supporter of my walk. And so when she found out about what happened, she was going to go talk to that missionary. And this is the only time in my life that I remember my father ever using his husband authority over my mother and said, don't, because he did not want her to be in a situation that could have been very, very, like he, in my entire life, he's only used the husband card one time. And it had to do with defending her in me it was it was really intense and it was like um and so what happened instead was there was a meeting with the pastor it's like what you defended me years ago when this person attacked me in a bible study i said do you remember that situation and i went to him and said it feels exactly the same and he still didn't so this what was this other missionary figure, doing? Because clearly I this know. missionary had a way to like yeah. wiggle his oh, way yeah, in there and like had, control like, what well, even the he pastor was, thought. I think the pastor was trying to hold on to his coattails because he had some notoriety. And so he was so blessed that that missionary would, would come and be with them. <laughs> that, that missionary guy started to amp up his, his pokes and jabs. I just made it a point to... Hold on a few more months. I'm moving to Florida. Just hold on a few more months. Don't say anything because I didn't want to leave a church on bad terms uh, because I had always left a church on bad terms. Every time I walked into the church, I had to put on the full armor of God. There was a period of time when he started to jab at me a lot. And uh, so what I started to do was read from the Psalms. We would be in like prayer meetings and he would say something that was intentionally toward me. I knew it, but it, that was passive aggression because no one else knew it, but I knew it was him saying something. And I started bringing up the Psalms that say, Lord, save me from the arrows that they hurl at me. 
everyone knew that I was getting more agitated. And so one day, at, right before church, he came over and sat right next to me and cried on my shoulder. And, and I was like, and I was shaking when he did that. I was literally shaking so violently. But, and I was should... furious. Yes, he was on my shoulder crying. Okay. Saying, I'm so That's sorry. Me. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? And I said, you get back into your seat. This instant. Go. I shouted it in church. But like I'm like, get the fuck away from me. I didn't say fuck, but it was like, uh, and so he Good. he walked over and sledged, and he acted like this poor little animal who doesn't understand anything that went wrong. And and so I uh, that is manipulative uh, bullshit. Him crying so like I, that is manipulative as fuck. Isn't that interesting though that people who victimize will never really focus on the victim they'll focus on themselves and like oh forgive right. me you know it's always right. towards themselves it's like these uh men that get caught in scandals you know cheating on their wives in the public and like right. i apologize to the world you know you know I, I was this and i was that and i wasn't in my right mind i wasn't right with god and i hurt my family and like they never apologize to the people that they actually hurt they they want yeah. forgiveness for themselves so they can feel better, but they don't care how you feel. They or really to have a better a uh, better standing among the public. Not to mention, he cried on my shoulder in church, so it was like so in front of see. everybody. And so when I said sit down, I made sure everybody heard it. And and so I started going in there and saying, if you truly are searching for forgiveness. Please understand that healing is not an instantaneous process most of the time. And it is something that will take some time. So in the meantime, I do ask that you not talk to me. Don't touch me. Don't make a reference to me. Just act as if I don't even exist. That would be the best thing for you. So that way I can have my spiritual walk and you can have yours. I was trying to be as amicable as possible, right? And then he said, but you do understand that the Lord God compels you to forgive me. And I, oh, did, fuck all the I, off. I did this. You are in no position to tell me that. The last day before I came to Florida, the, uh, the, the last day at church, he made amends to me. Like, I actually have to say, I think, because it was months. It was a month-long process from that meeting to when I left. And I think something happened where he did feel somewhat sorry. <laughs> and when he present that presented that at least some modicum of genuine remorse, that's when I was able to make amends with him. Now, making amends, forgiving is not the same as forgetting. And so I can still remember with the jabs of pain and hurt, the things that he said to me. I have a brand over my arm because Christ himself got pierced in his side. He has wounds that are still there today. I wanted something to carry with me. Uh, just to summarize, I am super into biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek. I'm a super duper nerd when it comes to scripture. The hardline traditions of old are dying. And I Yay! am really The open-mindedness I come across among the younger generation, at least of the congregation that I attend, is like, oh, this is inspiring. It's what Christianity is about. Not this, don't wear makeup, don't see a doctor, don't eat this meat, don't, uh, like, uh, like the stuff that we had because we were so attached to the law of Leviticus. Yeah. So that's yeah. now a spiritual walk that works for you. And the way I see right. your belief interacting with how you then interface with the rest of the world tells me that I don't see that you're going to make poor decisions that will affect my world in the same way that I see things like, uh, you know, the way the evangelical world works and has this like seedy underbelly that's literally trying to subvert our government. Right. So like, oh, I have so, so you much to talk about. I know, yeah, I know. <clears throat> but so you having your own spiritual walk, I always appreciate hearing about it, even though like, obviously, you know, your thing is about the Bible and my thing is like, well, that's one of the many old texts in the world. Why would we choose that one? Right. Yeah. And so we diverge a little bit on that. Right. But also, like, if it fucking works for you and you feel connected to the larger world around you and you feel like you found your place because of that, like, who am I to tell you you shouldn't do that?
my goal to Joel, it really resonated with me, your story about how um, people would make you feel, certain people <clears throat> in Christianity would make you feel. I want to get to the point where there aren't Christians out there that look at me the same way as an atheist that they do you as someone who's gay. Because we get the same sort of vibes from the Christian world to be like, oh, you're a non-believer, you're an atheist, you're a pagan, you're a heathen, all sorts of evil connotations that are associated with that. Excuse me. Um, right. I want our world to get to that point where we are not looking at each other as you're an abomination or we are heathens. That's the world right. I want to see. Right. So let's move Absolutely. away from an us versus them and recognize yes. that we are all together here on this rock flying through space and maybe we've got to work it out for how we can make it better for all of us. And the last thing I would like to, to say to, to, to really bring it home would be, yeah, I'm a Christian today. I do believe that Christianity, uh, like that the God that I worship is the supreme God. Like that's my personal belief. I think that beliefs are very strongly held opinions. And so the, um, so when it comes to, so when it comes to like my Christian walk, who the world am I, who the hell am I to say that, that someone in another religion is like, oh, they're just, God just hates them because of that. It, it's, it, no, I, I refuse to believe that. I refuse to. And, and if God really is that way, I don't want anything to do with them. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so that's all I have. I'm done. I'm out. Well, Joel, we really appreciate that you were uh, willing to be the guinea pig here and be our very first interviewee. I mean, it only makes sense. Yes. So thank you for being so willing to be open and to share all these hard things, these struggles that you've had and um, where you're at today. It's really good to hear. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from you with our Unpack It series. And obviously, we're all good friends now, so you're not going anywhere. Thank you for this. Um, I think my body just really wanted to get that out uh, right. for a while. Just say, And also, to anyone out there who might be watching this and who might who, who might be struggling with, with, with certain things like that. Oh, wow. I actually am getting broken up a little bit because of it. <laughs> Um, oh, it's, yeah. it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world to just come face to face with, with who you are and then, and then to walk forward from there. So it's not the end of the world. One thing that really helped me was when I was considering coming out, I came across a video of people saying, yeah, when you come out, it's really, really hard, especially if you're in a supremely conservative environment. Um, however, when you do come out, it's like, it will get better if you keep moving forward. Don't let it suck you down. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's all I have to say. And when people come out as their true selves, that's the hardest step, but it'll get easier, like you said, because you are going to find your people. You're going to find those people that also need to hear your messages and who will understand you. Those are the people who matter, not the ones yep. who are going to criticize you and drag you down. And allies. Amen. And allies. Yes. If nothing else out of this whole Apostate Sisters and Mr. Difficult projects that we're all embarking on, the goal to me is more feelings of safety for more people who have experienced uh, churches of high control and cults, because that is the number one thing that I see those types of organizations using to like, they undermine that on purpose to achieve the goals that they have of convincing people of their belief systems. Right. So that feeling of safety, like, if everyone just takes a minute to like think about a time that you felt safe and recognize what that feels like in your body, yep. right? Do you feel really heavy in your hips? Do you feel, you know, like a weight on your shoulders? What is it? What is it physically in your body that you feel when you are safe? And understanding what safety feels like and being able to connect to that, uh, especially while talking through some of these stories, mm -hmm. is just so important because that is a fundamental need that all humans have is to feel safe where they are. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing else that gets us through that underpins it all. Right. Yeah. So I, I treasure Joel that you felt safe enough to share your story with us and to share it publicly. I mean, that's really fucking huge. You know, buddy. 
Thank you. That, that really means a lot. I, that was really, really touching at the end there. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love this friendship. I love our connection. Um, I love how we can oftentimes just agree to disagree, but still jab at each other like the good friends do. And, and yeah. Yeah, no all condemn fun. condemnation here. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I mean, you are women, though, so just remember mm -hmm. that. <laughs> so ridiculous, all of I that. Know. Mm -hmm. We love you, Joel. Thank you. Love uh, you too. The story's amazing, and so much more to come. All right, thanks everybody for being here for our very first interview with Joel of Mister Difficult. Check us out on the Apostate Sisters. We'll be back with more interviews. Like See you and later. subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>